Uh, ladies and gentlemen, our topic this morning is the economics of legal tender laws. Now this is a subject uh, that is not very often discussed in uh, uh, economics classrooms. It's not part of the regular instruction of uh, economic students, more or less all over the world. And this is due to an opinion that in itself is justified to some extent, but as it ever so often happens, uh, not only in science, but also in day-to-day -day life, insights that may be valid within certain limits often get exaggerated, and then uh, when we overstep the orders, it gets deeply wrong, and thus misleads us very fundamentally. And the idea that legal tender laws could not have a major impact on the operation of the monetary system uh, is uh, to some extent justified and Austrians themselves have, have emphasized this at uh, some point in particular in the connection with commodity monies or metallic monies. At the beginning of the 20th century Ludwig von Mises reacted in his very first great treatise, The Theory of Money and Credit, against a German economist by the name of Knapp. This the question is whether we should grant him the noble title of economist, because there are good reasons not to, do to, not to do this. Knapp, in any case, was a member of the historical school, so in many ways he was more of an historian than of an economist, and he held the so-called state theory of money. That is, um, the, uh, the, uh, the most important aspect of which for our present purposes is that money is not simply a uh, uh, something that emerges on the free market spontaneously and, uh, uh, as a consequence of the actions of individuals interacting with one another on a voluntary basis, but money necessarily needs the stamp of approval of the government. Okay? So it is a necessary feature of money to be approved by the government. Unless the object in question has this quality, we should not speak of money. Now this uh, opinion is very old. Uh, it has not really uh, expressed for the first time by Knapp, but Knapp gave it new popularity in his, uh, in his period at the end of the 19th and uh, especially at the beginning of the 20th century. But we find uh, essentially the same opinion uh, already in Plato and in various medieval thinkers. Now this theory of, theory of Knapp's had been refuted, in fact, more than 30 years earlier by Karl Menger. Karl Menger is famous, at least among Austrian economists, for his Principles of Economics, which he published in 1871. And here we find a chapter 8 in which Menger discusses money. And one of the points that he stresses most is that money emerges spontaneously in a market process. As money emerges spontaneously because one individual in an economy uh, that operates on a barter basis, that is where people just exchange consumer goods directly one against another, apples against peers, apples against arm shares, and so on. One individual has the glorious idea that he might attain ends that he otherwise could not have achieved, and it might uh, uh, perform exchanges that he could otherwise not have achieved through an indirect exchange. And Professor Riesman has explained this before. Right? So we have here an apple owner who wants to buy cheese, but the cheese owner does not want to trade with him. So the apple owner thinks, well, what can I possibly offer the cheese, the, uh, the cheese owner, so that I get the cheese? And he finds that the cheese owner likes berries. And the berry owner likes apples. And so although he himself does not like berries, he will exchange the apple against the berries and use the berries as a means, means of exchange to buy the cheese. Okay? So and in this case, then the, the berries would be the medium of exchange. And here we have, in a medium of exchange, all the essential qualities of money. And the berries become money to the if and to the extent that other people mimic the technique that the apple owner has, has just invented or has discovered uh, and so the technique of indirect exchange spreads throughout the, the economy uh, and then there are various possible means of exchange that can be used and some are more physically be, physically suitable than others to be used as media of exchange. Right? Uh, gold in particular, gold and silver, are more physically suitable 
than armchairs and berries and cheese and apples as media of exchange. Right? And in fact, gold and silver have been empirically, that's the stark empirical fact, more physically uh, suitable than any other commodity. And so we might say that they are natural monies. Now that whenever there has been a free market, they have passed the market test. And here, since we, are, we often talk just about the gold side, and so we might add that uh, empirically, again, it is silver, which is the money par excellence. Right? It's not gold, which has much to our purchasing power, and uh, therefore, historically, has been used only uh, in large-scale uh, inter-regional transactions. Right? It's a typical money of, well, it's often being called the money of the kings, right? but it's also been the money of the big merchants. Uh, so for usual day-to-day -day transactions, silver is the money. So we should expect that in a free market, we have a parallel currency of several commodities, uh, precious metals, silver and gold coins and copper coins circulating side by side on a parallel basis in a free market, and that the overall circulation would be dominated by silver. So Menga's theory then proved that it was not necessary to, the, to have the approval of anybody but the persons involved for an object, for an economic good, to become money. Okay? No official approval necessary, whatever. Uh, so therefore, uh, official certification, legal tender, right, is not a necessary quality, not an essential quality of money. Now if you look at present-day textbooks, monetary economics, you find the same point emphasized again and again. Right? Legal tender laws are unimportant because it not, does not belong to the essential nature of money to be supported by a legal tender law. Now this, ladies and gentlemen, as I will show to you today, holds true only for commodity monies. Right? So, this, so this opinion that legal tender laws are unimportant for something to become money concerns only commodity monies. It does not concern paper monies, right? or we might imagine also elect electronic currencies and so on. For them to be in circulation, they need the support of legal tender laws, otherwise they could not possibly be in circulation. And I will, whereas uh, this has been a point that has been stressed already, at least in the Austrian literature, uh, I will uh, go beyond this and um, explain how legal tender laws for money have encouraged, promoted, uh, contributed to the development of fractional reserve banking. Okay. So I will then conclude that legal tender laws are in fact the angular uh, point of our present day monetary system, which features uh, paper money and fractional reserve banking on a mass scale. Uh, so the reason why we have these institutions today, why we didn't have them 300 or 400 years ago, is because, for reasons that I will discuss, legal tender laws have come to be applied to money substitutes issued by banks. If we look at uh, my, uh, my talk today, it will be based on a paper that I have published last year in the Journal of Libertarian Studies, volume 18, number 3 with the title, uh, it's Legal Tender Laws and Fractional Reserve Banking. If we look at the literature, the literature on legal tender so in economics, the literature is, uh, is very, very small. Right? In most textbooks you find no mention of legal tender laws at all, and in a uh, few textbooks on monetary economics you find the opinion that I just uh, expressed, uh, just mentioned, namely that legal tender laws are unimportant. Uh, expressed in two or three lines, or sometimes two or three words. Okay, so that's all that you find about legal tender laws. Uh, a handful of books mentions that legal tender laws historically have, be you, have been used to enrich governments at the expense of their citizens, and one or two mention, so one or two non-Austrian books mention that legal tender laws might have something to do with Gresham's law. Okay, Gresham's law. The Austrian literature it looks much better. First of all, in the Austrian literature we have a definition of do you have a question? Yeah, could you define what a legal tender law 
yeah, well, I was just going to do this. So in the Austrian um, uh, literature on monetary economics, we first of all find a clear definition of legal tender laws, which we do not, do not find in the mainstream literature. And uh, what the Austrians stress is that a legal uh, tender money is uh, a money that you have to have accept even if you stipulate that you can be forced to accept even if you, your contract initially stipulated payments in other in terms of other economic goods. So let's say we have two individuals, Paul and Peter. Peter is the owner of a Porsche, which is of course essential to my account now. And he sells it to Paul for 100 ounces of gold. Okay. Yeah. He sells it. Now, if the government has given a legal tender status to US dollars and he's, he's defined the legal standards as $35 equals one ounce of gold, okay, then Peter can be accepted, it can be forced to accept a payment of $35 at $3,500 in view of the 100 ounces of gold that were really stipulated initially. Okay. Now, of course, as long as uh, the free market rate coincides with the uh, rate stipulated by the legal tender laws or by the, by the judges uh, uh, in the, uh, the country in question, well, there it wouldn't matter much to Peter whether it be paid in, in dollars or in gold. But of course, usually there is a reason why people stipulate payments in a certain means of exchange and not another one, right? So there's a reason why Paul says stipulating his contract, well, I want to have 100 ounces of gold and not $3,500, right? And what usually happens then is that the dollars lose their purchasing power quicker than the gold, or the gold might not lose its purchasing power at all, but, but the dollars do. And at this point, legal tender laws have a great practical importance because Paul can then have second thought, uh, thoughts and say, okay, why, why hand over 100 ounces of gold? The legal tender laws give me the right to pay in terms of dollars. So you will use the dollars. Okay. So as a consequence then, legal tender laws give a competitive advantage to the, uh, to the money in question and they contribute to it being more widespread than it otherwise would. And in the case of paper money, it is, as I've said before, the very foundation of, um, of paper money itself. The crucial fact here is that paper money has no other purpose than uh, being a means of exchange. Right? If, if, if you take the, the wonderful uh, notes that we get from our authorities in the United States, in Europe it's equally beautiful to so have these, these paper slips, and the great works of art. Um, so what might we do with them if they lose all of their purchasing power and are no longer suitable as means of exchange? Well, some of them make it into uh, collectors, albums, right? And there are people who uh, 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 glue old, old notes on the wall and so on. So there are various uses for them. Uh, actually, there are few people who, who like a, a wall full of worthless paper notes and so on. So the point is, except for a, a few uh, rare, and in some cases, when they say, well, per perverse, um, uses as consumer goods, these slips have no other use than that as a media, medium of exchange. Okay? It is different in the case of commodity monies. Commodity monies have industrial uses, and, and most importantly, they have used as jewelry. Uh, so silver and gold uh, not only are rare and have all the other physical qualities that make them suitable as means of media of exchange, uh, they, they can also be used and have been used as jewelry. And of course, I mean, uh, uh, there is a very great number of industrial uses for both silver and gold. Uh, so as a consequence, even if they should lose tempo, temp, uh, te on a tempo, temporary basis, their status as a medium of exchange, their status as money, they would not lose all their purchasing power. Okay, they would still be scarce. As a consequence, they would still command market prices. 
Now, if you put this in, in uh, context with what you have heard at the beginning of the week about the regression theorem, right, about Mises' insight, about the, uh, the basis for the demand for money, I mean that this demand for money is always based on the, the past purchasing power of the monetary unit, well, then this means that even if the natural monies, gold and silver, should temporarily lose their status as the most generally accepted media of exchange, they can always regain this because they always retain market prices. It is different for this, ladies and gentlemen. As soon as this loses its purchasing power, it can never re-emerge spontaneously on the market again. Okay. And since this is so, in case we ever withdraw the legal tender laws that support these slips, right, they lose their competitive advantage over gold and silver. Right, they might initially because they are already in circulation to use for, uh, for a while. But of course, there's a, a particular risk that goes in hand with the use of these slips that is absent uh, from the use of commodity monies, namely the risk that they might lose their purchasing power. Okay? And then you're stuck with something that has no value at all and can never possibly regain value. So therefore, there's a systematic um, uh, uh, reason why currency competition will infallibly turn out to the advantage of commodity monies and will drive paper money from the market if ever we create a, a truly free market in currency. Now this um, this insight has led the Austrians uh, at least from the, uh, the 1970s onward uh, to um, propose right, as the essential element of any monetary reform the withdrawal of legal tender laws for paper money. And the most important work in this respect is uh, has been published by our friend Hayek. Huh? I guess they've been toasting to Hayek <laughs> despite everything. So Hayek has truly had a, a, a genuine idea in, in asking for the denationalization of money. Right? Yes, this 1976 publication, Choice in Currency, which was followed in 1977 by another book, The Denationalization of Money, which was an elaboration. Now, Choice in Currency is much better than the more famous denationalization of money. Why is that? Because in Choice uh, of Currency, he just proposed to open up the market and abolish illegal tender laws. Okay, so that's indeed the essential element on which Austrians agree, uh, still agree today. By the way, Henry Hazlitt and others at about the same time, Zenolds, have uh, made similar proposals. Okay, so Hayek was not alone in the Austrian camp, but he was the most famous one. A year later, then, in his denationalization of money, he added another element, namely, so he wanted to uh, describe how a competitive money monetary order would work, and instead of saying, well, it would essentially be a, co a competition between commodity monies, I cooked up a fantasy about the competition of paper monies. Okay? But there can be no lasting competition of paper monies. Uh, first of all, for the reasons that I've enunciated before, so in the long run, at least, there is a, the long run does not have to be long run, it, could, it can be a month or something, uh, paper monies will always lose out the uh, currency competition against commodity monies. Uh, but more importantly, in such a market, it is impossible to enter. Such a market is impossible to enter for new competitors. Right? Nobody has ever managed to introduce a new currency, new paper currency, on the market. Right? So I mean, I can just uh, I have no paper here. Right? I, I can make up my little paper slip and I write on it three Hultzmanns. Right? And I say, okay, here is my new currency. I'm the new currency comp uh, producer, and I hand it over to you. And said. Now you will work for me. It's, it's a fairly elevated price. Three hertz months is quite a substantial amount. And you will, you will work for me for a year. Right? Uh, so why does it strike us as, as ridiculous? Well, because precisely we do not know what uh, the purchasing power of any such new paper currency will be. Right? What is the basis on which we can know anything about its future purchasing power? Right? So that's the reason, because it's a pure fantasy uh, that uh, this has never, in fact, historically occurred uh, in practice. Right? Paper money has been introduced historically but only two, in only two ways. Two and only two ways. Right? First one was by transforming 
an uh, existing um, uh, circulation of banknotes into paper money. Right? Banknotes are of course not money, and some, some say it's bank money, it's somewhat misleading, but banknotes are, are uh, representatives of money, they're signs for money, they're legal titles for money. Okay? Uh, if we uh, suspend payments, sometimes I say, uh, 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 as those who say, they, they, they say they suspend payments, more uh, precisely would say, if we uh, break our redemption promise as the producer of these uh, money titles, then of course, and if we are not punished by the government, right, or one does not enforce our, our legal obligations against us, well then these uh, banknotes can remain in circulation and become a paper money. So that has, one, it has been one uh, uh, frequent technique. It is, uh, for example, the technique through which all Western European, present-day Western European uh, currencies have come into existence. Right? On, a system, on a widespread basis, uh, all uh, redemption promises have been broken by the, by the central banks under the protection of their governments in 1914 at the outbreak of, of World War II, World War I, and then again 1971, 73, when President Nixon closed the gold window, right? Another uh, euph uh, euphemistical uh, expression, right? Suspension of payments, closing the gold window. In plain terms, what he did was to break the redemption promise. promise right? The Federal uh, Reserve System had uh, a redemption promise which at that point did not hold good for Americans but at least for foreign central banks so it was under the legal obligations to redeem its notes and it broke this promise right so it um, uh, abrogated unilaterally its contractual obligation of course nobody was there to enforce this against the Federal Reserve System so this way then our present-day dollar paper money came into being the second technique has been the introduction of paper monies at a fixed exchange ratio with a prevailing money. That was, for example, how the greenbacks were introduced in civil, the American Civil War on the War of Secession in 1862. Okay, so what I'll uh, do now is to uh, highlight some of the implications of um, uh, these legal tender laws. In particular, we'll talk very briefly about Gresham's Law and uh, then uh, come to the discussion of, the, of its implications for the banking business. And compare, in particular, um, legal tender laws applied to banknotes with legal tender laws as applied to coins. Okay? And show that uh, in the case of banknotes, legal tender laws have great advantages uh, for the government and we will conclude therefrom that uh, this was the reason historically uh, why uh, inflation in modern times or, or the engine of inflation in modern times has been the banking system, not as in former times the mining and, and, and money uh, business. Okay, so first Gresham, Gresham's law, the most uh, simple way to, to illustrate this is that we posit that a legal tender status is given in a free monetary system in which, as we have said, it would, we would have to expect that there would be a parallel, current, a parallel uh, circulation of several commodity monies. And that's also what we have observed historically. And the government gives a legal tender status to one of these currencies. Okay, so let's assume we have a country, say Prussia, right? Prussia, Prussia is, is a nice example today because it no longer exists. So we have a Prussian currency, Prussia, and uh, so there's, there's a gold and a silver uh, circulation, and the government fixes the exchange ratio between gold and silver at uh, one ounce of gold to 15, uh, well, let me do it the American way, uh, one ounce of gold to 15 ounces of silver. Now again, as long as the exchange ratio stipulated by the legal tender law coincides with the market rate, the law will have no impact. The interesting impact occurs 
once the market rate deviates from the official rate. So let's say the market rate will change to 1 to 20. So in this case, one ounce of gold is really worth 20 ounces of silver, whereas legally, somebody who has um, uh, uh, let's say obligations uh, in, uh, in terms of silver, let's assume Paul, he is the debtor to, let's say, uh, 300 ounces of silver, Paul owes 300 ounces of silver. Now, if the market exchange, um, exchange rate moves to, to this, and uh, the legal tender is still here, then Paul could re redeem his, or pay back his silver debt in terms of um, Uh, what is it? 15, 15 ounces of gold. Now we need to construe it. Yeah, we, I, need to I need to construe it the other way around, right? Uh, so, uh, 300 ounces of, uh, of gold. Okay, so in, in this case, if the market exchange rate moves here, he could still redeem it in terms of Yeah, it takes more gold, right? I always get confused when I come to these examples. Excuse me? Yes. Okay, let's wait a minute. Let, let me see this. Okay, he, has, he owes three ounces of gold. He goes, uh, owes three ounces of gold. We would have to pay 60 ounces of silver. Okay, right, right. So he owes three ounces of gold. Three ounces of gold. And the legal, and let's say the contract stipulates a payment or in terms of silver. So, right, he would say, okay, I pay you. So the contract says, you owe me three ounces of gold, you will pay in silver. Okay? And then we have the legal tender law that says that legally, one ounce of gold is equal 15 ounces of silver, which would allow him to pay back his debt in terms of 45 ounces of silver. Okay? And as we see from this numerical example, Paul would win at the expense of his creditor. Okay. Now, uh, since this is so, what will, be the, what will be the practical implication in such a case? Well, the practical implication will be that the people will start to hoard the uh, undervalued money. That is, they will no longer use it in transactions and they will use in, the, in their daily transactions only the overvalued money. Right? It's that the, the money that is legally uh, more valuable than it is uh, in the free market. Now the money that is more valuable here uh, on the free market than in, in legal terms is gold. Right? So people would stop using gold and they would switch to silver. Right? In the daily transactions they would use only silver because they can, by using, uh, um, if, if they use gold, they could at all times be uh, compelled uh, by the law to accept equivalent payments in silver. Okay, so in order to avoid this, they use silver right away. Okay, so that is a rather perverse consequence, therefore, of a legal tender law. Uh, it is perverse in the sense that it brings about the exact opposite of the normal operation of a market economy. In the normal operation of competition, 
the best products tend to be selected. Of course, consumers err and so on, that's true, but uh, they, they, they do not err permanently and everywhere. Right? So as a general rule in a market economy, always the best products get to be select, selected. The legal tender laws have the exact opposite effect. People will avoid using the better product and switch to the worse. Okay. Now this process has been uh, described for the first time by a medieval theorist of the name of Oresmi, Oresimus, uh, a French bishop of Lisieux, which is in Normandy, and a confessor of the French king at the time. Uh, that's a wonderful thing. And Oresmi published a book a treatise on the alteration of money, which would today be translated into treatise on inflation. Right? Because the alteration of money was at the time the main technique for inflation. Right? What, the, what the kings did was to change the coins. Right? So we had the, the nice portrait of the king on it. And uh, then it says, okay, that's five ounces of silver. And what the kings did was uh, to create a coin that looked exactly the same, but which had not five ounces of silver in it, but less. Right? So like four ounces or three ounces, and they mixed in another inferior metal, copper or zinc or whatever. Right? And uh, so this was inflation, and uh, Orsmi pointed out, well, that it has disastrous economic e effects, and it is morally completely unacceptable. Okay? So it's, it's, it's really it's a deadly sin. For those of you who know what a deadly sin is, that is, yeah, that was quite something. Now, so you imagine this, you imagine this guy, it's not that you die immediately, but the soul dies, right? You don't get to heaven. You don't get to heaven. So you imagine this guy, right? So the foremost monetary theorist of his time, and the confessor to the king. Okay, isn't that wonderful? So, so the king says, oh, yeah, I diluted our money supply again. Oh, okay, you pray 15 Ave Marias. And you make good for what you've done. Right? You give money to the poor and you stop this immediately. And yeah, So that's what he would have told him. Like, wonderful. Right? So can you imagine Milton Friedman doing this today? <laughs> or, or Krugman? Right? What they say to the government is in fact, oh, wonderful, you, you've diluted the money. So yeah, go ahead. Create riches for us. Spending draws out of our economic mess by our own bootstraps. Just go ahead. Right? So that, the ladies and gentlemen, gives us a hint about, uh, 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 is, is, is a good indicator about the times in which we find ourselves. And, uh, an essential aspect of our present day troubles is that our uh, so-called intellectual leadership is none. Right? There's nothing left. Not only bad ideas, but also moral corruption. So Oresmi uh, uh, was the first one to, to point out this law, but it, it has been called uh, Grantham's law uh, in the in the 19th century, and the, the term has been uh, invented by the British monetary theorist MacLeod. MacLeod and MacLeod uh, found a description, so he didn't he know Oresmi, but uh, he had read the letters that the uh, crown agent, or that the agent of the British crown, uh, the English crown, at the biggest financial, uh, Europe's biggest financial market at the time, Thomas Grassham in the 16th century, the biggest financial market in Europe was in, uh, oh, oh, how do you say this in English? Uh, uh, I just know it in, in German, it's Antwerpen. And in French, it's Anvers. Yeah, it's in Belgium. It's a, it's a Belgian town on the border. Today, it's still Antwerp. 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 So st still today, it's a big uh, diamond industry there, right? So that's Antwerp. So they had the biggest financial market in the 16th century. And, and Thomas Gresham was the crown to his uh, queen, Elizabeth uh, I. And he wrote her letters, well, market reports. And uh, in the course of this, as people writing market reports today, so he gave also his various reflections on what's going on, and so he described the operation of Gresham's law in it. Right? So MacLeod read these letters and said, okay, so that's Gresham's law. Uh, that's how the law came to be called. Okay, 
So there's one uh, other observation that we need to make there for of uh, aggressive solids. So we said it, it perverts the selection process in the market. And what it does, therefore, is to create a twin phenomenon of fiat inflation and fiat deflation. Okay. That is, there is an artificial increase in the um, circulation of silver. Right? Silver is used more intensively than it otherwise would. Uh, and it used so more intensively than it otherwise would because of violent government interference. Okay, so we call it fiat inflation. But at the same time, as really a twin aspect of this, there is a less uh, widespread circulation of the other parallel currency that existed before, namely gold. Right? So gold in this case is not used at all. So the money supply of gold shrinks dramatically, and so we have a fiat deflation of gold. Yeah? So we might say then, legal tender laws, whenever they do not happen to coincide with the prevailing market rate, necessarily entail the twin phenomenon of fiat inflation and fiat deflation. In effect, it is lowering the value of the gold because it's, it's really worth twenty ounces of gold but you can only buy fifteen ounces. Well it's the legal tender law basically is not lower the value of gold. No, no, no. I mean I mean no no I'm not about the intrinsic value yeah. about the yeah. And by lowering the value of gold in that cash that people naturally are not going to spend something going to with three quarters. Yeah, that's that's what we mean when we say uh, gold is undervalued. Yes. Okay, so. So uh, second We need to uh, now make a further observation about this uh, twin phenomenon of fiat inflation and fiat deflation, namely that the inflation goes about quicker than the deflation. Oh, sorry, the deflation goes about quicker than the inflation. Once the legal tender law is introduced, the uh, silver currency, in our example, cannot be increased very substantially from one day to another. Right? So in the course of time, it will eventually be increased through silver imports. And the silver imports will come because people will export their gold. They will no longer use it within the country because there they only get less value for it. Right? So they will export it and buy silver abroad, and abroad they can buy higher quantities of silver for it. Right? So in the course of time, uh, the, uh, the silver currency will be increased. Right? But the gold currency will decrease immediately. As soon as the law is in practice, people will stop using gold in daily exchanges. Okay? So they will hoard it, as we say. Right? Gold really moves up to, to this value. Right? So nobody uh, engages in any more transactions that would entail uh, this exchange rate. So people stick to their gold and either well, dig holes in the ground of their garden and put the gold coins in there, right, or export it. By the way, uh, it's an interesting item of uh, history uh, of money, is a, a coin history. And uh, all uh, we know about, uh, most what we know about uh, past gold and silver coins comes through uh, gold treasures or uh, coin treasures unearthed or found by accident uh, in various holes in the ground and so on. And invariably what we find are the good coins. Okay, <laughs> We know that the reason why they are in the ground is that they had been hoarded and because the government had always imposed a, a legal uh, tender obligation and that's only the bad money where red coins did circulate. Okay, so people export this stuff and hoard it. So as a consequence, the, the deflation occurs much quicker and the all overall effect is therefore, at least in the short run, that there is a decrease in the quantity of money, overall decrease in the quantity of money within this economy. Yes? So a legal tender law in the short run creates a deflation, has a deflationary impact. Okay. Now, as I've explained to you uh, yesterday in my lecture on deflation, that is not bad per se. Right? What it, what it uh, means is that uh, the economy will henceforth be uh, operating on a, on a lower price level. Okay, that's fine. It might create trouble for some market participants, but it's no overall aggregate problem. Okay. Uh, but then, of course, my second observation was, well, that, that creates a huge political problem because we have an establishment, economic establishment of, uh, of merchants, of entrepreneurs who are in place and who do not like to be replaced by other people, right, who do not like to make a business failure go bankrupt. 
So what can they do in order to prevent this? Well, one thing they can do is to make greater use of fractional reserve banking. Okay? Because fractional reserve paper money tickets can be increased from one day to the other. Right? At least from a technical point of view, there is no problem whatever. Right? And here, ladies and gentlemen, we find this uh, corroborated by empirical evidence, uh, namely that uh, the introduction of legal, legal tender laws in all uh, the major historical periods under consideration went in hand with an increase of fractional reserve banking, with an increase of the practice of fractional reserve banking. Uh, so this was so in the wake of uh, the current British currency reforms instigated under Isaac Newton in 1720. It was so in the wake of uh, the legal tender laws in, in the United States of 1792, the Coin Act of uh, 1834. And each time you had an increase of fractional reserve banking due to this process. But legal tender laws promote fractional reserve banking also for a different reason. They also promote them directly. And to understand and, uh, uh, the reasons why this is so, we need to compare the effects of legal tender laws when applied to coins as compared to the case when they are applied to banknotes. Now, why this comparison? What's the justification? Well, in a way, in one respect, legal tender uh, uh, coins and banknotes are comparable. I mean, to the extent that both uh, are certificates. Uh, we have a coin, and I've said before, so we have here the nice portrait, and so on, of the ruler, and we have the banknote. And there, we also usually have a portrait of, of some ruler, a past ruler. Right? And I say, so initially, so don't think in, uh, of, of this note in terms of uh, paper money as it is today, but in terms of a uh, promise. So we have here the inscription IOU. Right? It's, it's, it's a promissory note. Okay? So in one respect, so they are comparable, namely that they are certificates. The inscription on this note makes it a certificate for um, the ownership of a certain quantity of money held with a bank, with the bank that issued this this note. Right? So let's say this is uh, a note over one ounce of uh, of silver, and this is a certificate that the holder of this note owns one ounce of silver held with the bank that issued this note. Okay, that certifi certifies ownership, and very similarly here. What is certified by the stamp is the metallic content of the coin. Right? You have in various textbooks, you have uh, completely uh, fantastic stories about the significance of the stamp. So what you invariably find is that, oh yes, this was a way of communicating between the ruler and, and the citizens. Right? So they needed to be aware of uh, how their Caesar of the time looked like, right? what they had bared. And, uh, at the time, we didn't have glasses. Uh, yeah, just, so just to, to communicate, kind of a medieval or, or ancient uh, technique of mass communication. Right? You didn't have TV, so you used the coin system. This, lady and, ladies and gentlemen, is complete nonsense. Right? It's, it's complete nonsense. They, at the time, the rulers and kings, they couldn't care less right, than what, what their subjects might think about them. Um, the reason why we had a stamp was that the stamp was a certificate. The stamp ultimately certified the metallic content of the object. And the only reason why later rulers, well, roughly speaking, especially from uh, the 14th century onward, put their portrait on it was, was that they wanted to show even to the illiterates, right, who couldn't read the inscription, the Latin inscription, they wanted to show, okay, this is the guy who certifies it. It's your king. Okay? That's the reason why we have the portrait on it. Okay, so what we have here then is invariably also a certificate of a certain certain amount of money contained within uh, the object. Now the difference is obviously that uh, here the certificate is physically integrated with the, the quantity of money that it certifies, whereas here it is separate, right? The certificate is separate from uh, the monetary object that is certified, right? and therefore we speak of a money substitute. Okay. 
Now, uh, let's consider uh, the case of uh, legal tender laws and applied first to coins. Right? So we have here one ounce and then what the king does is to create a bad coin of exactly the same physical appearance Uh, it's maybe not exactly the same, right? Because sometimes they mix in different metals, copper and so on, so it's, it's more uh, reddish and so on, and as you could see. But if it's well done, it looks fairly well, exactly as before. Okay, so what are the problems that go in hand with this? Well, first of all, we have to say, this process takes time, okay? Inflation takes time. It's a production process, uh, evil production and so on, but it takes time. So as a consequence, and this is the most important uh, aspect, as a consequence, during the time of inflation, during the uh, dilution of the, of the coin system, the money supply becomes heterogeneous. It's no longer composed of homogeneous coins. Okay? There are coins circulating side by side uh, that have different uh, content of precious metal. Right? And the, according to the law, they are treated on an equal footing. Okay, so this coin is exactly the same legal status as this one. Now what will happen, of course, uh, what happens is that people will start hoarding these coins as soon as they are aware of this and only using the new coins. So invariably then, legal tender laws when applied to, uh, to uh, commodity money, uh, inflation uh, in terms of commodity money, entails a heterogeneous uh, money supply and thus entails fiat deflation. Right? and all the problems that, uh, that come uh, through it. And of course, this is certainly not a very uh, nice aspect for the king. Right? The king might resort then to um, uh, inflation of this sort in the, uh, in the short run, but in the medium and long run, he will in invariably hurt himself because uh, uh, he will create economic uh, troubles for the economy, so the tax basis on which he operates will be reduced. Uh, there will be um, constant complaints by the, by the merchants that they cannot achieve the money prices that they need to operate profitably and so on and so on. So that's not a very nice thing. And then also the country that uh, has frequent resort to uh, such legal tender laws will be shunned by foreign merchants. So the international or interregional division of labor uh, will be impaired. Now, all of this is not in the interest of the government. And finally, we might make a, a third observation, at least, well, so that's a theoretical observation because it, it apply, concerns a case that is never obtained in practice, that in case the legal tender laws um, were granted to all coin producers, not just to the one coin producer uh, under the control of the king, so in case we had competitive money production under legal tender laws, well, it would imply that we had a complete um, uh, uh, a hyperinflationary process. Right? Every single money producer would have an incentive to reduce the metallic contents of the, of the coins as far as possible until the coins were com uh, uh, consisted only in the most, uh, in the least valuable metal. Right? So it might uh, initially have been a silver coin or a gold coin and at the end they would use the least valuable uh, metal such as aluminium. Right? Uh, cases of this sort have existed in monetary history. I will, we cannot go into this. Okay, so now let's consider banknotes and uh, uh, compare this to uh, the inflation, case of inflation, the case of, of uh, coins. And of here, uh, here in this case, the, the most important observation that we need to make is that in the case of banknote inflation, the money supply does not become heterogeneous. Right? The additional money supplies, uh, uh, issues of banknotes that come into place and uh, make the uh, banking system a fractional reserve system, um, do not only look exactly like the old banknotes, but they can be used on exactly the same footing as all the others. Right? And a banknote issued before the bank has turned it into a fractional reserve bank gives me the same rights, not more, 
than a banknote issued after that. Okay. So as a consequence, I do not create a, a problem of, of fiat deflation. I do not create uh, uh, adjustment problems for the economy. I do not reduce the tax base for the government. And as well, I do not disrupt international economic cooperation. Rather, quite to the opposite, uh, what I do is to increase the price level within my country and as a consequence, uh, because I, uh, I can afford to export some of, uh, some of the gold, some of the money, I can command higher, uh, uh, greater imports than I could before. So, at least in the short run, I can, through this technique, enrich my country at the expense of other countries. And the second conclusion, the second observation is that um, in this case, the the money supply is not extended indefinitely. Right? Uh, if we have a competitive banking system, the individual bankers do not, they do have an uh, incentive to increase the money supply as far as possible, but not indefinitely. Right? Because at some point they're still obliged to redeem their banknotes, so they uh, need to uh, uh, retain at least a precautionary uh, reserve of, um, uh, of money and, and limit the issue of, of, um, of banknotes. So there's a limitation here. So there's no race to the bottom uh, of the monetary system. Right? And so we can have at least, well, conceivably, uh, a smoothly operating economy. So this then, uh, we, uh, we, uh, we come to the conclusion that Legal tender laws, when applied to, to banknotes, have great advantages, at any rate from the point of, uh, of the government, over legal tender laws applied uh, to the coin system. And we have fear a material motivation for uh, the governments of the past 300 years to privilege inflation coming through the banking system to inflation being done in the traditional medieval ways. Uh, so we can uh, give an historical account of the trans great transformation that occurred, roughly speaking, in the 17th to 18th century. Uh, before, the traditional way of uh, engaging in inflation was to dilute the uh, metallic content of the coins. Afterward, it was to promote banking. That's exactly what the, the kings have been, been done. And the motivation, or well, one motivation, we find here. Uh, so, even if we, therefore, uh, do not engage uh, in Austrian economic, uh, in, the, in the general Austrian case for, uh, 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 against uh, fiat money and fractional reserve banking, we even, we, if we make an uh, abstraction from, uh, from this, we can say that um, fractional reserve banking uh, paper money have certainly not only whatever their, their intrinsic merits might be, uh, most historians today are, of course, inflation is in their monetary theory, so they think that the reason why we have paper money is because it's more efficient, it allows us for monetary policy and so on, which in turn presupposes that monetary policy has any positive effects, whatever. Right? And the reason why we have fractional reserve banking is because uh, banks have contributed to economic development. It's right? so a kind of a Darwinian uh, selection process in which the more efficient institutions come to be retained and the other is the institutions discarded. This, in the light of Austrian economics, is complete nonsense. Right? The reason being that in artificial increases in the money supply cannot increase uh, the quantities of goods and services that could possibly be sold against these things. And all they can do is to redistribute the benefits resulting from the existing goods and services from one group to another group. And so the real story of the emergence of paper money and fractional reserve banking is not uh, its, its greater contribution uh, to overall economic performance. The real story is that it is more efficient from the standpoint of government. It's a more efficient way of ripping off the subjects right, to the benefit of the government. Right. And it's great comparative advantages as compared to right, the, the ancient ways of, of doing this. This was it. You have about was it, one minute for questions. Yes.
Yeah, but then of course it's always possible, right, for for uh, for the courts uh, to get around this and say, okay, the law also applies to these cases, right? I mean, why should this be a problem? Uh, the the very point of legal tender tender law is precisely to overrule uh, individual choices, right? So it's much more evil than, for example, monopoly, right? Often you find in libertarian uh, uh, writings, so you find a denunciation of monopoly. Well, that's good and fine, but monopoly, ladies and gentlemen, is much less harmful than a legal tender law because a monopoly, okay, grants special privileges for, for certain market participants, but it does not overrule the choices of all others. Right? A legal tender law does precisely that. Like, okay, what, whatever you choose, it doesn't really matter. We tell you what you really meant by your, by your contract. Okay. So 19, no, pardon me, 1971, though, isn't gold just a commodity like oranges or anything else? And couldn't somebody trade a car for so many oranges or trade a car for so many ounces of gold? Yeah, right yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, it, well, it's not true that gold is on the same footing with uh, with oranges, right? As I mean, if, as, yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, it, it is gold certainly is also a commodity, right? But it is still used as uh, still has monetary uses. Right? I mean, yesterday we heard uh, to uh, Mrs. Kornetschuk, right, about uh, the, the Turkish uh, operation of Turkish markets, and so gold still has a, has a function there. Uh, and there is a reason why legal tender laws are only applied to stipulate the exchange rate between paper money and gold and silver, not between paper money and oranges. And that's because oranges are not natural monies, right? They do, do not tend to be used. Well, what would happen today, is, since we have legal tender laws for uh, US dollars, is that if such a practice became widespread, the, the courts would find, um, would determine uh, an exchange rate. That's what they do in all such cases. Well, I mean, it's true that uh, um, uh, medium of exchange is uh, demanded predominantly because there's a purchasing power and because there are reasons to expect that it will have a purchasing power in the future. Right? The point is only that ultimately this purchasing power in the case of paper money is, is built on government interference in the economy. Most importantly, so legal tender is very important, but there are other aspects as well, for example, taxation. And right? if you can pay your taxes only in terms of uh, dollar bills, well, then there is an additional demand for, for dollars only for this reason, so they always command some purchasing power. Mm. Well, there, there's no such thing as a demand for um, uh, a medium of exchange per C that is only based on this, right? So if we have a competitive money market, right, then the ultimate reason why we demand uh, such a thing uh, also depends on considerations of, uh, of, of risk such as the ones that I've presented before. Right? So the reason why there is a demand ultimately for Federal Reserve notes is not that it commands, a, uh, that it presently has a purchasing power, but that it is bolstered by government intervention. That would be the answer. Yeah. International market, the absence of the laws. Why do you, what do you, how do you account for the prominence of the U.S. dollar that still is in the same measure? Can you stand back and think it's acceptable? Can you buy it? Uh, so, sorry, that's still my class. So, well, briefly, <laughs> briefly uh, reply to the question. Well, from the standpoint of the, of the world economy, the United States is an area where the dollar is enforced. So every foreigner can, at the very least, always sell his dollar holdings to the United States where they must be accepted. So that's the reason why the dollar is uh, accepted. So they're backed by US assets? They're backed as, uh, ultimately by uh, the coercion that the US government can exercise on its citizens. Thank you.